<laughs> you just said you were not. I'm glad you're at it. Since you're already in a minute. Good. Um, I have an amendment from Representative Cordelli. Is that what I'm talking about? When you said there was one you were working on. Uh, I have I have one amendment. for each bill. Yeah. Now we're are we on. Well, we never got it. 1586, there was an <coughs> amendment supposedly coming in on that on when we were met the last time and you said we didn't have time to get it. And so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Department of Ed just brought me for 1587. Representative Kirk and the Department have been working yeah. on 1587 and they have made an amendment and agreed to it. 1586 is Representative Cordelli's bill. And he handed me an amendment for his bill. Okay. So which one do you want to do first? Do you want to have the amendment for him? Well, I have we both. Have, we have 1586, we already talked about that. So. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, so we'll continue it and yeah. flow nicely in the trees. Representative Cordelli, would you like to um, just tell us the difference? Sure. And make it easy for the committee? Easier. 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 Uh, yes. Uh, on this sheet, well, as just indicated, the, uh, uh, the changes, um, there is uh, the definition of disclosure. Um, there had been a, a piece of the FERPA definition left off of the end. So just this just adds the missing phrase to the end of the FERPA definition of disclosure. Um, next, the definition of statewide longitudinal data system or student database. Um, Representative Spang um, indicated at our uh, discussion, our hearing of the bill, that uh, possibly student database was not defined, so we added that into this section. Um, the next one, 17 and 18 on the amendment sheet, um, there had been a, a typo and um, the identity of the teacher in the original bill was the identity of the student. Um, the next on lines 22 to 25, um, expand. Uh, the, which page the, the first page of this. Uh, oh, oh, of the uh, of first the page of the. Uh, Amendment. Okay, which page is the other one on that? Okay, which page in, um, uh, that is on page uh, five. Line, um, up at the top, I mean four, I think. B. Um, it had been the data are limited to information directly related to the assessment of student knowledge and skills, and I added a, um, Additional uh, piece in there it shall not contain psychological data in the student, including assessment of co non cognitive skills or attributes, psychological resources, mindsets, etc. Um, and that was based on um, the state of Georgia. Uh, had a consultant who was um, working with the legislator down there. They took my bill and was modifying it, and that was one change or addition they put in the bill in Georgia. Which 
I thought was uh, worthwhile. Uh, back to the amendments um, of 18969, section 1, juvenile delinquency records. Um, that is on page 5 also, about the middle of the page. Um, it just adds uh, 1A, juvenile delinquency records. Um, other than criminal or correctional records that might be necessary to meet um, needs of the student or ensure safety. one is in that same section, K, family income. This was something that um, I discussed with the Department of Education, um, but it not made it into the original bill. Um, there would be instances where they might want to put into the student database family income information if it was needed to uh, determine participation in uh, a program or receiving financial assistance. difference but the E six carries a lot more information with regard to teachers evaluations. is more comprehensive. More comprehensive. Yeah, exactly. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it looks like it carries the same weight in all the bills. Sí. 
case looks like it's Center of the Department of Education that was one of their top recommendations for uh, a, a school district was to have a data inventory providing that information. Um, data element dictionary, and this has a sample of what one other state is doing if you want to look at that. Um, and if you look at State got grant to build a statewide launch tool database in the federal government. Um, uh, it included several positions, one of which most the database administrator whose accountability is to include <coughs> and maintain the data dictionary. So, where they get the idea that it's going to cost $320,000 um, and you know, all sorts of people. <coughs> You know, one of the people that they put in their grant request is supposed to be doing it. Developing it or maintaining it? Maintaining it, implement, implement and maintain. But creating it, I think it's well, with the consultants. They're in building a, a database, like this, a data, data elementation, you know, there are all sorts of tools that uh, software providers uh, provide to do that. Oracle, for instance, um, provides a free utility to build a data element dictionary for you if you use um, the Oracle database management system. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. In several places in your bill, you talk about boards, school boards establishing a policy after a public hearing. And, and my concern is that if we codify a public hearing on a, on a lot of policy matters that school boards routinely handle. Are we, in a way, hamstringing the school board to getting some of these things done? No, that's, I, I that's think my concern. My um, concern <coughs> is so significant on these items that I think that there should be a public discussion. Um, that came up in earlier discussion of um, one of the other bills by the previous subcommittee about uh, communication and being public involved. And so I think things like um, putting cameras in classrooms and um, attaching um, devices to students to measure their attentiveness. Um, I think things like that certainly require not just a board decision, but also parental um, input into that decision. And that all is being done currently. Um, and I can provide you all the information on that. <coughs> What's being done currently? Um, the videotaping for the, in classrooms for the purpose of teacher evaluations. Um, uh, in not in New Hampshire that I know of. Um, uh, the Gates Foundation has talked about five billion dollars to put class, uh, cameras in every classroom. Uh, they're doing doing it in Tennessee, Denver, Chicago, Texas, right now. Um, You'll see, um, I've got information that I just got this weekend about um, conferences that are going on, calls for papers for um, use of uh, EEG technology um, to measure uh, students' um, attentiveness and learning and engagement, things like that. So this is 
And so I was just wanted to uh, get out in front of it um, and provide for uh, for a in a session. <coughs> I, in principle, support both of these bills. And the reason I do is I fear that a lot of data that's collected would get in the national databases and be subject to data mining and over the long term violate the privacy of the future of the school. Does your, does your bill prevent that from happening? That's the real concern of mine. I don't want, I don't want national databases and search engines on the internet to be able to access someone's school performance and psychological evaluations. It's a major invasion. That's why I support this in principle. Are you, I, the, um, does the bill address that concern? Uh, the U.S. Department of Education has said that they are not building a national database, and that is expressly prohibited. Um, but the uh, FERPA laws were greatly loosened in 2008 and 2011 that provides um, for sharing of confidential information um, without written consent in the past that had been uh, required to have written consent to share a lot of this information. Um, and that can be provided for a whole host of reasons, um, including to researchers. And um, one of the reasons I included teacher protections in there was because of this statewide database, one of the purposes is for teacher evaluation, this teacher information being gathered in that database. And the department has gone out um, with an RFP um, last year to hire someone to help them with um, evaluation and teacher professional development. So I want to make sure that all of that information um, stays confidential to the extent that we can um, and it is not shared. And it, it's not just sharing with the person you contract to. Um, it's preventing what is called redisclosure. So that person shares it with that person and on down the line. Mm -hmm. I, I want to prevent that as well. So detailed that uh, I, I, we don't, we know so little about. There are concerns about medical information, um, and I think I didn't include that in here because I think it takes more, more work. Uh, based on if um, if there is a health facility in the school that is providing medication, that falls into one care category. But they don't even in immunization records. But Representative Cordelli, yes. I, I, I wasn't finished. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was just using that as an example okay. of one of the questions that have been brought up. Um, if that's not in here, then that particular one isn't a problem. What it suggested to me is there's so much in here that that is new. Uh, uh, I mean, many of us have been asking questions like, is that really happening? And it's so new a lot of it to us that we don't know what the unintended consequences is of some of this are, it's, it's uh, all the additional stuff in here uh, that has me a little worried. Um, I, I would, what I came into here, I, I want to uh, listen to all these opinions and, and uh, my mind isn't made up, but I came in here kind of thinking this bill needs to be studied more to make absolutely sure that some of this uh, stuff we don't know much about, it, uh, limiting so much that this bill does, is it going to end up with unintended consequences where uh, the DOE is not going to be able to measure things that really are important to protecting our students in other ways. You know, like I, I was reading it over and I was thinking back to the suicide prevention bill we heard. Um, uh, 
sometimes the issue arose there. I know that, that that's been defeated. But some schools, we, they did testify that some schools are already doing all they can to try to monitor for this. And, and, and I don't remember now, but one, one thing I read in particular made me worry if, 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 if the kind of thing we need to notice to prevent suicide um, uh, could, could be prevented from this bill, the kind of monitoring. I just think there may be a lot of questions like that we don't know the answers to yet. So I would like to hear that issue uh, discussed um, by, the, by the committee. Well, one thing that I said that these bills could have been combined because I I doubt we're going to do both. But we're talking about them separately. Sure. And that's difficult. Can we talk about them together? <coughs> uh, if in the eventuality that only one would be approved, can we talk about which one is more likely to avoid the pitfalls, <coughs> uh, possible let pitfalls, me, and achieve what we want? Let me give you the amendment that the department and that the department wanted are in red. And I believe Mr. Schwartz is here for the department. Oh, Representative Kirk is here too. And Representative Kirk is here too. So they can um, talk about their yeah. agreement. Thanks. We're looking at 0367H with the red markings on it for your information out there. that we can do it clearly, this does it clearly, so there's less fodder. The lawyer will not get as fat off this bill as many others. Well, um, I've, I've worked with um, Mr. Schwartz on this, and we both agree that this is a good amendment to go forward. It allows the department to do what they need to do, especially in the areas uh, of special education, vocational education, and so forth. And it adds significant privacy protections for student data. Mr. Kirk, Representative Cordelli's bill also involves teachers, and I made the decision that I didn't want to mix students' privacy protection with teachers' privacy protection because I thought they were very different and needed to be done separately. 
Um, frankly, I used his bill as the starting point. I took things out of his bill that I felt, such as the teachers, that needed to be dealt with separately, and things that were a little too far out for me. <laughs> um, but I kept a lot of things that he had in there. And we have to but for example, he had some very good sections about using um, RFID tags on students. Um, and, and that's, yes, that's, that's right. dealt with here. It was a good idea. Um, it, and also tracking um, surveillance software and things like this. So he had some good ideas, and I took those. But I focused basically on the student privacy. This bill has been thoroughly vetted, thoroughly vetted by the department. And they persuaded me to do some things which I have some problems with, but we'll put in another bill next year to deal with some of those issues. If this goes forward, we will be able to say with respect to Common Core that there are no privacy issues. Common Core may be a lousy idea, Common Core may be a good idea, but we can't attack Common Core because we're not protecting privacy. This, this really solves that, especially the last section, uh, last page, which um, I've worked with a, a number of people. The bolded language uh, cuts out a lot of the uh, workarounds that people have developed for um, people who were, quote, involved with the student's education. They don't get this. That's not an exception anymore. Um, this is about as tight as I can make it. Somebody else may have some better ideas on this. Um, this is a package that works. It's focused on students. Um, the ideas that, that are, the other ideas in uh, Belly's bill, including the teacher stuff, is, is really worthwhile. But I think it needs to be dealt with separately. Whether you can do it this section, the second, the next section is a different issue. But there are teacher privacy protections that need to be addressed. Don't get me wrong. I found it too complex to do them in the same bill. So that's a long winded answer. No, that was very helpful. I was very helpful to this committee. Because they are similar, but there's a lot of differences in the two bills. The status of student or teacher are very different. And the teacher actually, in some ways, gives up more privacy than the student because you're a public employee exactly. and subject to more scrutiny. So they are very different concerns. So I agree with Representative Perk. They should be dealt with separately. I think she's got a very good point here. Thank you. 
going to
to stop it, and then you end up with data going out that's uh, that's out of control. Once it's out, you, don't it's get about, it you back. can't get it back. Yeah, I think exactly. that's the problem complaint of everybody. So, anything to do with the internet, once it gets out there, you never get it back. Exactly. And someone so, puts some salacious thing out there, and you, you spend the rest of your life trying to move it down. Right. 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 So, if, if, you're talking, about, if you're talking about student privacy, if we approve the Kirk bill then that will be taken care of. It won't be out there. That's right. No, I agree that something has to be approved, but I just think that you know, getting, getting a handle on, on, on a lot of it now would, would solve a lot of the problems. And not getting a handle on it now would uh, be like saying, okay, well, we'll deal with that down the road. And that's passive I wish, I wish and, they'd come in under two separate teachers and the students and two separate bills. Yeah. school pride, the number of kids that go to the top rated schools. I wouldn't want to do anything that would not permit a public school to do the same thing.
I feel strongly about this. I'm going to have first response and strength. Okay, ready for it and speaking on the floor on this. So, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to make the motion. I, I was in the past in 1587. I'm going to move on the past on the amendment.
your email address the one that's on the website? Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, they do. Our comment was, um, it's not necessary. Right now, you have a 
I hope somebody drove that home with him that it's not at all about the association. What? I know it needed to be right. Well, I hope. I mean, I, I talked to the Karen that Did you testify before you left? Okay, I'm going to. I'm going to start the subcommittee on 1432 first. And uh, I want to um, alert to the committee to the fact that we have two amendments that are being presented. Um, yeah, I have a copy of uh, the sponsor's amendment for you to look at. And um, I and then we have one other amendment which has not yet been uh, formally adopted um, in down um, in a legislative uh, services. services. Thank you. <laughs> that would be a good meeting. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with. Representative Mortaki's amendment, and I'm going to ask him if he can explain the difference, if he'd like to. Would you like to explain <coughs> the difference between the bill and um, what your amendment does to change the bill? Um, is there not a copy? Oh, he didn't get a copy. Sorry. You can come over through with us. No, he can stay. Oh, okay. That's all right. I'll get the tall chair out of the way. You, you can yeah, bring the chair up. Oh, this is up there? Yeah. Sure. Sure, just come over here. That's fine. What's it right here? Sit right there. I'll sit beside Barbara. She's not for it. Oh, dear. Oh, I just pushed the tall chair out of the way so it <laughs> makes us more of a group. By the way, uh, may I have a copy of Oh, sure. Do you have the original bill too? Uh, you know, uh, I, I do not. Um, but uh, conveniently, this amendment replaces the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's really all we need to go, go on. So, uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, thank you very much for uh, asking me to make a comment. Uh, there were uh, extensive public hearings on this bill uh, that covered two days worth of, of hearings. And uh, there were a lot of um, good substantive critiques that were offered uh, on, this, on this bill. For example, uh, the Department of Education pointed out that the, uh, one of the focus points for the original bill was a common core state standards framework document and that that was simply an advisory um, you know, it was meant only as an advisory to the school boards uh, and we both understood uh, after uh, after talking that that was actually quite misunderstood by many of the local school boards who uh, viewed that as a mandate simply because it was posted on the Department of Education website Could you so just wait one second so, I'm missing my purse and this is oh. a this is not good. So, uh, 
So basically, the amendment uh, essentially replaces the entire bill as introduced, and it addresses a number of substantive comments that had been uh, introduced by both the public comment and by members of the committee during the hearings, uh, as well as written comments that I received subsequently from uh, a number of groups, including the Department of Education. So. Uh, some of those comments were included, you know, for example, I just mentioned that the uh, Common Core State Standards framework that was posted on the Department of Education website was, in fact, a, 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 supposed to be a non-binding advisory to the uh, SAUs and the school boards. Uh, that, in fact, uh, you know, as, as I understand it from my discussions with many school boards across the state, uh, as well as members of this legislature, as well as people from our own SAE 42 administration, uh, we did not understand that that was simply an advisory. So uh, the Department of Education agrees that in their next update to that framework, they will in fact go ahead and you know, make sure that uh, it is more uh, well understood that it is an advisory. There is, however, remaining one, one part, and that is that uh, the framework does mention that in the spring of 2015, the Smarter Balanced Assessment was in fact going to be uh, administered to the schools. And yes, that's, that's the framework document. So the Common Core State Standards aligned the Smarter Balanced Assessment is still planned for administration to New Hampshire Public Schools in the spring of 2015. So the, the, the thing that we wanted to focus on in the first part of uh, House Bill 1432 was to delay the administration of that assessment beyond the original plan date of spring 2015. So the amendment basically goes ahead and tightens up the language, first of all, to eliminate any reference to a common core state standards framework document, and to focus on the delay of the of the implementation and administration of the smarter balanced assessment to beyond that uh, starting point of the date. Um, there had been some thought that the original bill was introduced, uh, attempted to eliminate the annual assessments that we do here in New Hampshire, which are required by law. Uh, that was never the intent, and so part of the amendment's purpose was to also, uh, you know, reword that first part of the bill to eliminate that misconception. So it is. It was never the intent of the bill, as introduced, to eliminate annual assessments uh, in New Hampshire public schools. So uh, hopefully, the amendment actually goes ahead and clarifies that we are not planning on doing that, that we're simply asking for a delay of the administration of the Smarter Balanced Assessment by two years or more. The, uh, there were also public comments that were received that the, uh, the second part of the bill, which essentially called for uh, the Legislative Oversight Committee, which is an existing committee, uh, exists by statute, uh, be directed to do a number of things, which included, uh, in the original bill, holding public hearings in every executive council or district. So part of what we did to the second part of that bill was to amend the second part of the bill so that the Legislative Oversight Committee is called upon to conduct one or more public hearings, essentially at times and places of their choosing. So the bill no longer mandates a uh, public hearing in every executive council or district. And while we, uh, you know, the, um, the sponsors of the bill felt that that was not a bad idea, on the other hand, we do understand that we don't want to bind the hands of the LOC overly much. So we believe that that amendment is, is probably friendlier to the Legislative Oversight Committee. Uh, we also included a comment um, that was made by a public comment that it would be a great idea for the bill to go ahead and, and mandate that every uh, local SAU uh, conduct public hearings. Uh, we believe that that's a good idea except the part about the mandate. 
And so what the amendment states for the second section is that the Legislative Oversight Committee, as it conducts the study, will incorporate voluntary uh, submissions of information from uh, organizations which include local school districts, uh, you know, should they go ahead and conduct uh, one or more public hearings with regard to the implementation factors of the Common Core and the assessments. So that basically summarizes the amendment, which replaces the uh, original bill in its entirety. The spirit of the bill remains the same, but it's been tightened up to address uh, some apparent misconceptions and misunderstandings uh, you know, by people reading the bill. Uh, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it certainly improves the bill. <clears throat> I still have a couple of questions. Um, the section two. I put a question mark and now I don't remember why. Let me read it again. question uh, as they relate to the quality and rigor of the educational standards using international benchmarks. I'm, I'm not quite sure what that line 18 um, really, I, I question line 18. I do see a need for uh, the uh, availability of adequate technology. Well, it certainly uh, improves the bill. We have another amendment. Uh, may I ask a question here? Yes. So, uh, of the representative. I, I, in the original bill, you had referenced um, the delay of competency assessments, and I noticed that that's no longer in your That's correct. That's in your <coughs> yes. the competencies out. That's correct. And they continue as they're doing right now at the high school. Right. Uh, the original understanding was that the uh, competency assessments were uh, intricately, you know, tied with the smarter balance assessment. That not being the case, that wording was removed from the bill. Okay. Um, section two. Line six through eight, the Department of Education in coordination with the United States Department of Education shall provide one or more alternative summative annual assessments for use by New Hampshire school districts in compliance with RSA 193C. Why not allow the Smarter Balance assessments to continue to be given uh, to enhance the learning, uh, to, to allow for the learning part of, of, of uh, you know, getting a, a, the, let me start that again. Why not allow the Smarter Balance Assessment to continue because it's a learning experience. They're not being counted, but by learning how to take the test, learning the, the procedures for the test, then you can better determine uh, what technology is still going to be needed in the schools. Um, the tests aren't given as a group. They're given over a period of six weeks. They're given to one or two kids a day or three kids a day or whatever, or five or six a week, so that it would be a chance for the children to get used to taking the test rather than all of a sudden, then in two years, um, they then begin taking the test, and they're going through the learning curve then. So I don't like that section of um, the beginning of that, where there should be one or more alternative tests. I think that they should still continue to use. That's also going to be a problem with districts who are already 
very involved in the Smarter Balance Assessment, the Common Core uh, standards, um, they, they, they'll they have to apply for some sort of moratorium uh, on, or some kind of a waiver on the bill because they don't want to stop, they want to continue to go because they're still, they're working on that already. Because we did have testimony from districts who said, you know, we're, we're doing fine and we're happy with this and it's working great. So I, I just have, a, you know, I have a little bit of a problem with that. Um, Madam Chair, could I, yeah. could I go back to something you raised and, and ask the representative sure. to ask for clarification? Um, on line 18, um, the chair alluded to the international benchmarks. Could you clarify those for me? What, what the international benchmarks are different from what a benchmark say in, well, a, just for instance, No Child Left Behind or Common Core. What, what is, I, and maybe I should know this, but I don't, what, what are the international benchmarks relative to what we're doing? Do you have some idea on that for me? Yes, uh, <coughs> uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, some of the uh, testimonies that have been uh, given with respect to the Common Core uh, in New Hampshire and elsewhere uh, have, you know, included comments by uh, professors Milburn and Stotsky, who were originally involved in the development of the curriculum standards. Uh, one of the criticisms that both professors uh, have uh, essentially had of the, of the Common Core, including the testing and the curriculum standards themselves, were that if you measured them against what they call international benchmarks or international standards, that there were some state standards, which included, by the way, Massachusetts and California, that regularly uh, ranked very, very high you know, in international standards. And so that if you considered states like, say, Massachusetts as a country, that their math standards, by example, would rank, say, in the top 10. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I was uh, alluding to in this uh, amendment. Uh, if the committee doesn't like the term international assessments, I could attempt to uh, alter that. You know, I could run down to OLS immediately after this uh, meeting is, is over and see if I can amend that if the committee feels that that is uh, desired. Yes. The some of those, uh, New Hampshire already has career <coughs> and college ready standards, which are being uh, combined with the Common Core standards. And so, you know, we already have our career and college ready standards, which are quite um, popular. Um, they, they show a uh, tremendous amount of, of uh, insight and were developed um, specifically to meet New Hampshire's needs. So, yes. If I may respond to that. Uh, there are a couple of points that you made. Uh, I'll respond to this one first. The, this bill does not stop the state in, or its political subdivisions in any way from continuing to use the common core curriculum standards which are being written into not only our, do they form our math and ELA standards at the, at the state level, having replaced the legacy grade level expectations that preceded them. Uh, but also, you know, the state has, provide, has been providing resources for curricular materials. And the individual districts, including my own school district, Nashville, uh, has been essentially integrating common core uh, curriculum standards into other parts of our curriculum resources that we do. Uh, this bill does not in any way stop that process. The only purpose of this bill is to essentially delay by two years the statewide mandate to implement the Common Core, uh, align smarter balanced assessment test. It's only focused at the <coughs> mandated statewide administration of the SBA. This bill does not stop the uh, continuation of, say, field testing 
of the smarter balance assessment because you are correct, uh, you know, Madam Chair, in stating that as a new technology, the smarter balance assessment, which involves adaptive testing and psychometric evaluations, which have not been done in the past as part of an academic assessment, uh, those, if we're going to perfect it, you know, we've already had pilot tests last year. Uh, a number of New Hampshire school districts, including Nashville, will be field testing the SBA this year. Uh, continuation of field testing on a voluntary basis may in fact be necessary to go ahead and eventually reach that assessment 2.0 that everybody is talking about that we may someday use. This bill does not stop that. This bill only stops the mandatory statewide administration of these tests. Okay, um, I think if, it's, and if the committee is in agreement, I would like to allow this amendment to be uh, presented to the main, um, to the full board. Full committee. Full committee. Do I need to say? Got the wrong hat on this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Start on again. I'd like to submit, uh, to allow this to be submitted to the, um, to the full committee for discussion. I think it would, because it does drastically uh, reduce the uh, requirements in the bill and makes it more palatable and I think this it replaces the bill so I think we should allow this to go in and uh, we have another amendment I, I have a question now chair regarding yes. uh, one of the representatives here yeah regarding the amendment it, it's right up on line six through line eight where it reads, the Department of Education in coordination with the United States Department of Education shall provide one or more alternative summative annual assessments. Um, are we talking statewide assessment, and have you discussed with DOE in terms of when they're reporting regarding uh, federal grant monies, Title I, they, generally speaking, will use um, NCE scores or whatever to say, here's how we're, we're doing statewide. If we have one school district now saying, well, we're going to use another instrument, uh, ACT Aspire, another one going to use Iowa Test of Basic Skills or CAT, um, how are they going to have common data to respond to the feds? Well, that's basically, uh, we did receive a written input from the uh, Department of Education. The uh, director, Heather Gage, uh, had gone ahead and responded in writing. You know, to a number of questions, which I believe a, a copy has been provided to the, the chair of the committee. Uh, it was on the CC list, I believe. But in any case, um, this bill actually took that into consideration. And uh, we recognized from the very beginning uh, when we were uh, looking for a delay of the Smarter Balance Assessment that annual tests were required by law, not only in New Hampshire, but by federal uh, education law. And that the U.S. Department of Education and the New Hampshire Department of Education have to work together in order to agree to, uh, you know, the uh, alternatives to the SBA. Uh, it was my understanding from the uh, written comment from the Department of Education that the uh, that the essentially the proposal for the ESEA waiver included uh, the fact that the New Hampshire was planning on using Smarter Balance Assessment as an alternative to NECAP. So it is my understanding, and it is within the scope of this bill, that the New Hampshire Department of Education does need to work together with the U.S. Department of Education to find acceptable alternatives. It's really my thought that, practically speaking, it's really only one alternative. The reason why I said one or more is that there has been discussion within the U.S. The, uh, the New Hampshire Department of Education, and also discussed at our uh, at our district, that New Hampshire may in fact allow the SAT, for example, to replace the the uh, SBA for grade level of 11 annual assessments. So that possibility uh, still exists. So if this bill were to say one as opposed to one or more. This may actually inhibit the state from allowing the SAT, as an example, the core aligned SAT, to be used as a grade level level assessment. 
Madam Chair, could I, could I just before we move on, it, if the representative is possibly going to make some changes on this, um, where it says in line six that the Department of Education, I think it would be more appropriate to say with approval of the United States Department of Education rather than in coordination with, I, I, I just think that we would need their approval not necessarily have to coordinate with them. And, and, and I just think that would be better wording. Um, that's just my opinion. And then the other, the other issue, I think, is the clarity of what is meant by international benchmarks. I think that's, that's going to be unclear to the committee as well as to the subcommittee. And, and so if we are going to accept this amendment, I, I would certainly like to give the representative an opportunity to address those two concerns. I not necessarily accept it, but, but allowing it, it to move yes. forward. I'd also like a, would you like to comment on that, uh, um, that section about the Department of Education in coordination or with approval with the United States Department of Education to provide one or more alternative summative annual assessments for use by New Hampshire school districts in compliance with RSA 193. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Heather Gage with the Department of Education. And um, this, uh, Representative Mayor Tompkin, I did go back on the email a little bit um, with some questions that he had. One of the one of the responses um, was around allowing school districts to choose their own assessment, which really depletes the whole idea of having a statewide assessment for a variety of, of reasons, not just because we should or anything like that. There's a lot of good reasons behind having one, um, but. Just to be clear, the conversations around the SAT are conversations. They're, they're, you know, gosh, I wonder if we could have an assessment that kids took um, possibly more seriously in, in high school. And so we've been starting to have those conversations with the field, you know, around those areas. That the SAT is not going to be aligned to, to our state standards in 2015, 2014-15. Um, That's the year that we are the most concerned about with this bill. We're talking about an assessment that will be administered a year from now. In order to develop, adopt, review, go through the peer review process at the, uh, at the U.S. Department of Education, which takes a significant amount of time, you know, all of those options, they're not realistic in the time frame that we have left. And so to be able to adopt another assessment, which is, we have no idea if it's going to be better, worse, or anything compared to the Smarter Balance um, assessment that we're having right now, it is, it's just not practical. It's not something that we can even um, entertain. Now, we would have to get approval from the um, U.S. Department of Education to do another um, type of assessment, where right now we have, there, you know, we're working very closely with the U.S. Department of Education through the collaborative of the Smart Balance states, as well as you know, folks that are working in the park states um, to move forward with the Smart Balance assessment. This assessment has been tested and retested within our state, with, with our teachers, to take this back at this point in time and say, you know what, we know it's March, we know you're going to go through a field test, but, it, um, but what's going to really be used for accountability purposes next year is a whole new test that you don't know, even know anything about, and neither do we as a state department. It's unfair to students and it's unfair to teachers. Now, could I ask you a question? Go okay, ahead, you were first. What? Oh, oh, well, thank you for deferring to me. I would have I'm a, the I'm chair, so. Um, just to follow up to the consequences, and, and this is one of the things that's worried me right along with our waiver. Are we compelled, and, and I know that's strong, but are we compelled by the feds? to implement a single test to all the students in this state in 2015? We are, we are required through our state and federal laws to be doing that, and it was also one of the requirements of our waiver, yes. And, and a follow-up, and what would happen, would it be money we wouldn't get if we didn't comply? I mean, what would happen, what would they do to us to make us unhappy? So on the, on the programmatic side, we would risk losing our waiver. That's a programmatic issue. There's no money attached to the to the waiver. So that's a programmatic issue. We would certainly jeopardize our waiver. On the financial side, when, when the state receives money, as I hope everybody would expect, when the state receives money from the feds, we sign off saying we're going to follow the law of this program. So title, let's use Title I as an example. So we receive approximately $40 million in the state just for Title I funds. 
and we sign off saying we are going to follow the Title I law that's in um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Through that law, it requires that the state implement a statewide assessment for every student in the state, um, and that it's aligned to the state standards. So if we sign off on that saying that we will, and then we don't, one, we're breaking the law, which is something that we don't like to do, of course, and then two, we um, are risking the federal funding of them saying, oops, you didn't do what you were saying you were going to do, you now have to take all the funds back from the schools that you provided it to, and we're gonna take your money to them. Could, how much is that? Is it if you have an idea? Well, it's you know for for Title One funds, it's it's a um, for this last year, it's um, almost forty million dollars um, for special education, Title Two, Three, Four, um, uh, college, uh, the career technical um, uh, funds that we receive. Those I would say about one hundred and sixteen million. So we jump about all. Yes. Not, not just the test. Yes. We jump like all, all the whole basket of money. But all of those all of those assessments are attached. Yeah. That's what we have been told from the vets. Now, my question is, in the next year, will you be studying the, will you be getting input on a regular basis from the school and studying how the smarter balance is working? Is it aligning to, is this something that you already have in your plans to do. Absolutely. And not only that, but as uh, Representative Mark Tonkin said, we're always looking at other options. You know, not, you know, for the SAT is, is a perfect example. Um, we're looking at all of our accountability. That's what we do. That's what we are required to do by, you know, the morality of being a public servant to always look at the, the tests that we're given, the assessments, the accountability system, all the programs that we provide to make sure that we're doing the best that we possibly can for students and teachers. And you are, in, in this process, you are getting feedback also from, if I remember correctly, you said that there were surveys that were out there now that you were um, receiving back that were explaining the system requirements that the different schools had and who is not up to par, who is working on bringing their districts up to par, and I noticed that um, there was a, a big article in the paper about Gosstown that has just adopted um, several hundred thousand dollars in their school budget for this year to bring their schools forward to 21st century learning. They didn't say they were bringing it forward to accommodate smarter balance or anything else. They were just coming into uh, bringing forward, uh, bringing their schools into 21st century learning, which involves the use of computers. And um, so 